Imagine a cold December evening in 1773, the streets of Boston alive with a tension so thick you could almost touch it. The city's residents, already simmering with resentment over British taxation, faced a new indignity, the Tea Act. This law allowed the British East India Company to flood the colonies with cheap tea, undercutting local merchants, and enforcing a hated tax. Rebellion was in the air. For months, Boston buzzed with anticipation. Colonial newspapers had tracked the journey of seven ships carrying tea, four of them headed for Boston. In other colonies, protests had forced the ships to turn back, but Massachusetts Governor Thomas Hutchinson was determined to prevent that outcome. As dusk settled over the harbor, long shadows crept over the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, and the Beaver. These British ships, each loaded with chests of tea, had become symbols of British oppression. The crowd's anger crackled in the cold winter air, a living, breathing force. By evening's end, a consensus was clear. The tea would not be unloaded. Welcome back to Compelling History. Today, we kick off our four-part series on historical flashpoints, beginning with the night that ignited the American Revolution. Before we dive back into Colonial Boston, don't forget to subscribe to stay updated on future episodes. And if you find this story as fascinating as we do, hit the like button. It really helps our channel grow. The year was 1773, and Boston's crisp, cold air carried the scent of simmering discontent. The bustling port city, with its cobblestone streets and colonial architecture, was the epicenter of a brewing storm, one that had roots in both economic and ideological soil. The Boston Tea Party, a pivotal moment in American history, was not a sudden outburst of rebellion, but rather the culmination of a series of events and grievances that had festered for years. To understand the conditions that led to this historic act of defiance, we must delve into the intricate web of colonial economics and British policies. The relationship between the American colonies and Britain was like that of a parent and a growing child, fraught with tension and evolving expectations. The colonies, initially founded as outposts of British expansion, had grown prosperous and increasingly self-sufficient, yet they were still tethered to the Crown's authority and economic interests. In 1763, Great Britain emerged victorious from the French and Indian War, but the victory came with a hefty price. The British Empire, seeking revenue to cover war expenses and maintain its global presence, turned its gaze toward the American colonies. Parliament began to levy taxes on the North American colonies to pay for the debts incurred by the war, disrupting the colonies' long-held practice of self-government. The first significant imposition was the Stamp Act of 1765, which mandated that many printed materials in the colonies be produced on stamped paper from London, carrying an embossed revenue stamp. This direct tax was met with fierce resistance and was eventually repealed, but it left a residue of resentment. Next came the Townshend Acts of 1767, which imposed duties on common items like paper, paint, glass, and tea. These acts were intended to repress colonial dissent, but instead reinvigorated it. In March 1770, tensions boiled over into violence when British troops fired on an angry mob in the Boston Massacre. Though most of the Townshend duties were repealed later that year, the tax on tea remained as a symbol of British authority. The rallying cry of no taxation without representation began to echo through the streets and meeting halls of Boston. Merchants and consumers alike boycotted British goods, leading to economic strife and heightened tensions. By 1773, the British East India Company was struggling financially, burdened with millions of pounds of surplus tea and facing potential bankruptcy. To address this, the British government introduced the Tea Act of May 10, 1773. This legislation allowed the company to sell its tea directly to the colonies, bypassing colonial merchants and undercutting local prices, even with the tax included. The Tea Act also permitted the duty-free export of tea from Britain, though the tax imposed by the Townshend Acts remained in force. The Act's principal objective was to reduce the massive amount of tea held by the company and to undercut the price of illegal tea smuggled into the colonies. However, colonists recognized the implications of these provisions, viewing them as an attempt to assert British control and implicitly force them to accept Parliament's right of taxation. Boston, a hub of resistance, reacted with particular intensity. The Sons of Liberty, a group of radical patriots, spearheaded the opposition. Led by fiery orators like Samuel Adams, they saw the Tea Act as a Trojan horse, a deceptive move to entrench British taxation and monopoly. Public meetings were held where the rhetoric grew ever more impassioned. 
pamphlets circulated, stoking the flames of rebellion and urging colonists to take a stand against this infringement on their liberties. Dissenters like Adams invoked no taxation without representation, while others like John Hancock continued to smuggle tea into the colonies, undermining British authority. Governor Thomas Hutchinson, a staunch loyalist, was caught in a precarious position. He was determined to enforce the law and ensure that the tea ships anchored in Boston Harbor unloaded their cargo. Yet, the Sons of Liberty were equally determined to prevent the tea from ever landing on American soil. The standoff between the governor and the colonists grew more intense with each passing day. As November turned to December, the tension in Boston reached a boiling point. The wharves, usually teeming with commerce, now buzzed with anxious anticipation. Meetings at the Old South Meeting House grew larger and more heated. The colonists knew that the deadline for the tea's clearance from customs was approaching and a decisive action loomed on the horizon. In this charged atmosphere, the stage was set for a dramatic confrontation. The conditions, economic pressures, ideological clashes, and the unyielding spirit of a people yearning for autonomy had all aligned, leading to an inevitable act of defiance that would soon echo around the world. On the night of December 16, 1773, the Sons of Liberty, disguised as Mohawk Indians, boarded the ships and dumped 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. This act of defiance, known as the Boston Tea Party, was not just an isolated event, but the result of years of accumulating grievances and steadfast resistance. It was the spark that ignited a revolution, a testament to the power of collective action in the face of perceived tyranny. And thus, the story of America's fight for independence moved inexorably forward, with Boston at its heart and tea at its tipping point. On a cold December day in 1773, the streets of Boston buzzed with tension. The city's residents, already simmering with resentment over British taxation, were now facing a fresh indignity, the Tea Act. This legislation allowed the British East India Company to sell its surplus tea directly to the colonies, undercutting local merchants and enforcing an unpopular tax. The stage was set for rebellion. By mid-afternoon on December 16th, thousands of Bostonians gathered at the Old South Meeting House. It was an imposing structure, a symbol of resistance where voices echoed with defiance. Among the crowd were merchants, laborers, and artisans, all united by a shared sense of injustice. Samuel Adams, a firebrand of the American Revolution, stood before them, his presence electrifying the assembly. He spoke passionately, condemning the Tea Act and urging the colonists to take a stand. The tension in Boston had been building for months. Colonial newspapers had widely reported the schedule of the first shipment of tea. Seven ships departed for the colonies, four of which were bound for Boston. While protesters in every other colony managed to persuade the tea consignees to resign and thereby force the tea ships back to England, Massachusetts Governor Thomas Hutchinson was determined to prevent that from happening in Boston. Outside dusk settled over the harbor, casting long shadows over the three British ships anchored there, the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, and the Beaver. Each vessel held chests of tea that symbolized British oppression. The crowd's anger was palpable, a living thing that crackled in the winter air. As the meeting stretched into the evening, a consensus emerged. The tea must not be unloaded. When the tea ship Dartmouth finally laid anchor in Boston Harbor in late November 1773, thousands of people had descended on the Old South Meeting House. Led by Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty, the people passed a resolution to compel Dartmouth's captain to return the tea to England and appointed 25 men to keep watch over the wharf to prevent the consignees from unloading the tea. Around 6 p.m. on December 16th, Adams gave a signal, a subtle nod to a group of men who had been preparing for this moment. Disguised as Mohawk Indians, their faces smeared with soot and their bodies draped in blankets, they moved with quiet determination through the darkened streets. This was a calculated act, a cloak of anonymity to protect their identities and underscore their message of defiance. The men, numbering around 60 to 130, reached Griffin's Wharf under the cover of night, the harbor was still, the water reflecting the moonlight in rippling patterns. Climbing aboard the Dartmouth first, they worked swiftly and methodically. With hatchets and axes, they broke open the chests, the sound of splintering wood echoing across the water. Tea leaves, thousands of pounds of them, cascaded into the harbor, creating a thick, dark layer on the surface. The salty tang of the sea mixed with the earthy aroma of tea, an incongruous scent that marked this act of rebellion. 
As the chests were emptied, the men showed remarkable discipline. Each participant fulfilled a specific role. Some pried open the chests while others heaved them overboard, and a small contingent stood watch to prevent interference and ensure no one from their own ranks stole the tea or destroyed additional property. In fact, the rebels harmed no other property or people besides the tea. When some of the men allegedly broke a padlock belonging to the captain of one of the ships, the Patriots returned the next day to replace it. From the Dartmouth, the men moved to the Eleanor and then the Beaver, repeating their actions with precision. The night's stillness was punctuated only by the splash of tea hitting the water and the murmured orders among the rebels. Spectators gathered silently on the docks, their breath visible in the cold night air, eyes wide with a mix of fear and awe. By midnight, the task was complete. The men, their work done, melted back into the city, their disguises discarded, their identities safe. The harbor was a swirling mass of tea leaves, the moonlight now reflecting off the water's disrupted surface. The ships, now lighter, bobbed gently in the tide, their cargo holds empty. The city of Boston lay in a hushed anticipation. The participants in this audacious act of defiance returned to their homes, carrying with them the weight of what they had done. This night would be remembered, its significance growing with each retelling. For now, the immediate aftermath was a silent city, a harbor stained with tea and a brewing storm of repercussions yet to come. When the sun rose on December 17th to reveal 342 crates of tea floating in the harbor, Governor Thomas Hutchinson condemned it as an act of treason. As dawn approached, the first light revealed the scale of the night's events. Bostonians awoke to the sight of the tea-strewn harbor, a testament to their collective resolve. The Boston Tea Party was a clear statement against tyranny, a bold step towards a larger conflict that would soon engulf the colonies. The night's silence would soon give way to the clamor of outrage, debate, and ultimately revolution. But in those early hours, Boston stood on the cusp of history, having struck a daring blow against the might of the British Empire. In the crisp dawn of December 17, 1773, the city of Boston awakened to the scent of salt water and the distant, pungent aroma of tea leaves mingling with the sea breeze. The previous night, colonists had boarded three British ships and dumped 342 chests of East India Company tea into the frigid waters of Boston Harbor. This bold defiance, later known as the Boston Tea Party, was a direct protest against the Tea Act, which had granted the British East India Company a monopoly on tea sales in the American colonies, effectively undercutting local merchants. The immediate aftermath of the Tea Party was a mix of jubilation and trepidation among the colonists. Samuel Adams, one of the event's orchestrators, declared it a triumphant act of protest against tyranny. Adams worked tirelessly to publicize the Tea Party, promoting it as a defense against British taxation and a last resort to save colonial rights. His cousin, John Adams, praised the Tea Party as a brave exertion of popular power. However, not everyone in the colonies shared this sentiment. Prominent figures like Benjamin Franklin and George Washington disapproved of the destruction of property. Franklin felt that the interlopers should compensate the East India Company for the damaged tea, while Washington viewed the Tea Party as a flagrant overstep by the Sons of Liberty. Across the Atlantic, news of the Boston Tea Party reached London in early January 1774. The reaction among British officials was one of shock and outrage. King George III, upon hearing the news, was infuriated. The destruction of private property, especially that belonging to the powerful East India Company, was an affront that could not be ignored. The King and his ministers, including Lord North, the Prime Minister, saw the event as a direct challenge to British authority and a dangerous precedent of rebellion that needed to be quashed decisively. Lord North, determined to respond with a heavy hand, reportedly said, Whatever may be the consequence, we must risk something. If we do not, all is over. The British government's response was swift and severe. By March 1774, Parliament had passed a series of punitive measures known as the Coercive Acts, or more derisively by the colonists, the Intolerable Acts. These acts included the Boston Port Act, which closed Boston Harbor to all trade until the East India Company had been compensated for the destroyed tea. The Massachusetts Government Act significantly altered the colony's charter, restricting town meetings and enhancing the power of the royal governor. General Thomas Gage was appointed as the new royal governor of Massachusetts, further raising tensions. The Administration of Justice Act allowed royal officials accused of crimes to be tried in Britain rather than in the colonies, effectively shielding them from colonial justice. The Quartering Act required all colonies, not just Massachusetts, to house and supply British troops on demand, further exacerbating colonial fears that their charters could be violated. 
The impact of the Intolerable Acts was profound and far-reaching. Boston, a bustling hub of commerce, was economically strangled. Ships lay idle, and warehouses remained full as the lifeblood of trade was choked off. The closure of the harbor caused widespread unemployment and hardship. Yet instead of isolating Boston, the acts had the opposite effect, galvanizing the colonies into greater unity. Sympathy for Boston's plight spread, and support came in the form of food, supplies, and resolutions of solidarity from other colonies. Colonists across America united in their opposition to the coercive acts, fearing that similar punitive measures could be imposed on them. The First Continental Congress convened in September 1774 in Philadelphia, bringing together delegates from 12 of the 13 colonies to coordinate a response to the British actions. This assembly marked a significant step towards colonial unity and cooperation. The Congress issued the Declaration and Resolves outlining colonial grievances and calling for a boycott of British goods. More importantly, it established the Continental Association to enforce the boycott, a crucial move towards a collective colonial resistance. In London, the escalating crisis in America was met with a mixture of disbelief and determination. Many British officials underestimated the depth of colonial resentment and the resolve of the American people. They believed that a display of military might and firm governance would restore order. However, they failed to grasp the profound ideological shift taking place in the colonies, where the desire for self-governance and liberty was growing stronger with each act of repression. The Boston Tea Party and its aftermath marked a significant turning point in the relationship between Britain and its American colonies. What began as a protest against taxation without representation had evolved into a broader struggle for autonomy and justice. The punitive measures intended to subdue the colonies instead fanned the flames of rebellion, setting the stage for the American Revolutionary War. The events that followed demonstrated the perils of underestimating a people's quest for freedom and the unintended consequences of attempting to rule through coercion and fear. Thank you so much for watching our video on the Boston Tea Party. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it, and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the second video in our four-part series on historical flashpoints, the Apollo 11 moon landing. We took a short break from our regular content to regroup and improve on our videos, but we're back now and really looking forward to sharing our weekly videos with you. Let us know what type of topics you want to see next.